Welcome to our service of worship this morning. Friends, it is God who calls you to this place and to this hour. God sees more in you than you see in yourself. You cannot be absent from heaven's presence or apart from God's redemptive judgment. The Holy One sets aside your past and calls you to life today and to freedom in the future. So let your heart sing God's praise for loving you for who you are, for loving you the way heaven does. Today is Palm Sunday and you received a palm branch as you entered worship. Uh, please feel free to wave it whenever we're singing. It's a small gesture which connects us to our scripture text for today. And one way that we join with those who lined the streets of Jerusalem to welcome Jesus on this special occasion. We are planning two worship services for later this week. Both of them will be held in the main sanctuary at 7 o'clock. One will be on Thursday evening. It recalls the events of Jesus' final meal with his disciples and the institution of our sacrament of Holy Communion. And the second service will be held on Friday evening. It recalls the darkening shadows which enveloped Jesus, which then led to his crucifixion. All of you are welcome to attend either or both of these worship services. Now, we've ordered 25 lilies for Easter for next Sunday. If you would like to sponsor one, you are welcome to do so. Um, gosh, I forget what the cost is. I think it's like $7. $7. And uh, if you would like to sponsor one, you can just uh, put your money in the, uh, in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary. Um, today, on your bulletin insert, um, I have listed some responses that I am looking to all of you to make during my sermon. This is one way that I'm going to keep you awake today. <laughs> so uh, when you look at the bulletin insert, you will see there are four different times to respond. And the letters there, um, A means all or everybody, uh, W means women, and M means men. And so I'm looking for you to respond uh, accordingly, and I will give you a tip as to when to begin. Uh, let's see, I think that's it for announcements, except that none of you could see what I saw during the playing of the prelude. I watched our organist, Mary Louise, and she was really into the music she was playing this morning. And I knew this by the way she was bobbing her head. Mary Louise, good job. If you would please, let's direct our attention to the choir as they call us to worship. Now I would invite those who are able to rise and let us sing together our opening hymn, number 175.
Please be seated. Recognizing that we are all very human and that we need and we stand in the need of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, I invite us now to join together uh, in offering our confession. Let us use the words printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. O oh God, we remember how people hailed and welcomed your son on the day we call Palm Sunday, and how many later called for his crucifixion. We confess that we feel a guilty, uneasy kinship with these people. We too lack solid, well-thought-out principles against which to test the challenges of our day. Remind us, O oh God, of the courage of Jesus, who set his face steadfastly toward Jerusalem, even though he knew the fate which awaited him there. For his sake, grant us renewal of your offer of mercy, unearned and undated. In his name we pray. Amen. Friends, Jesus Christ, who is the source of our salvation, died for our sins once for all, to put to, to death the trespasses in which we have been living and to destroy the dominion of evil among us. Through Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled to God and made partners in a new covenant. God is compassionate and merciful, granting us clean hearts and new life in Jesus. So let us rejoice in this awareness and show forth our praise to our Creator. Let us now rise and sing together our Gloria Patri. scripture readings today. The first is from uh, Psalms 118. So if you want to follow along in your bulletins or you want to get to Pew Bible, you can do that uh, verses 1 through 2 and then 19 through 29. In fact, you may recognize some of these words from our liturgy between this scripture reading and the next. The second one will come from Mark 11, 1 through 11. And I realize they're printed in the bulletin, I know that. But I'm old school. And I'm reading it from the Bible, okay? You do as you choose. All right. So we're here at Psalm 118. We're going to go through one through two. Goes like this. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. We need to remember that. The next part the second part of that reading is from 19 through 29. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stones the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. That's pretty clear what he's trying to tell us. His love endures forever. Let's move over to Mark. And here we are, Mark 11, 1 through 11. And this talks about his triumphal entry. So let's read this together. I'll read, you can follow along. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, Why are you untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since he was already late, or it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. May the words of these two texts for today find a place in our minds and hearts as we consider God's message for us today. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Now, before I start my sermon, I want to invite all of you to pull out that bulletin insert that has all of the things I'm going to be asking you to say as I make my way through my sermon. And I'll tell you when it is that you can begin reading, okay? The streets of Jerusalem were crowded Pilgrims from all over the known world had come to the capital city to participate in one of the greatest of the Jewish festivals, the Passover. This Jewish festival recounts how Moses and God met in the Sinai Desert. Moses was a shepherd at the time. While watching his flock, he notices a bush which burns but isn't consumed by the flames. Curious. He draws closer, and then a heavenly voice speaks to him. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. Who is this that speaks to Moses? The voice says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Remembering that anyone who saw the face of God would die, Moses turns away and hides his face. I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt, the Lord tells Moses, and the God of Abraham is going to save them. And then God surprises Moses, for the Lord God intends to use Moses as a savior who will lead the people out of Egypt. But Moses is reluctant. He's a nobody, a mere shepherd. And besides that, he speaks with a stutter. He certainly can't be a leader. Surely God can find someone better suited to this task. But God convinces Moses that he will receive all the help he needs his brother Aaron will assist him, and he will receive signs to show that heaven is in fact with him. Sure enough, that's what happens. Moses receives a staff and the ability to change the staff into a snake and then back into a staff again. In order to convince Pharaoh to let the people go, Moses and his brother Aaron warn the Pharaoh of, a pla of plague after plague, which will be visited upon Egypt by the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Plagues of blood and frogs and gnats and flies, a plague on Egypt's livestock, and other plagues, including boils and hail, locusts and darkness. None of these plagues, however, cause Pharaoh to change his mind and let the people go until, that is, the tenth plague, which is visited on the firstborn throughout the land. In this plague, the angel of death will kill the firstborn among the humans and animals throughout Egypt. However, the angel of death will pass over the homes of all the firstborn among the Hebrew people. Now, on the night before their escape, God tells the Hebrew people to be ready at a moment's notice. They aren't even to add yeast to their flour. They will eat their bread unleavened, what we today call matzah. 
And then in the morning, after all the firstborn of the Egyptians have been killed and all of Pharaoh's people are in mourning, Pharaoh finally releases the Hebrew people. And under the direction of Moses, the people leave Egypt. Their exodus is from a life of slavery to a life of freedom. However, Pharaoh later regrets his decision and sends his chariots after the Hebrews. In order to escape this threat, Moses parts the waters of the Red Sea so the people can pass through on dry ground. Unfortunately for the Egyptian army, which was breathing down the necks of the Hebrew people, the sea waters flood back into the seabed once the Hebrews are safely across and all the soldiers drown. Moses then leads the people to Mount Sinai in the desert where the people receive Ten Commandments. They would later wander in the desert for another 40 years. And then finally comes the day when they cross the Jordan River and enter the promised land, the land of freedom, a land flowing with milk and honey. The Hebrew people, looking back, at that evening, the evening before the people left Egypt, that evening would forever after be a special day, a day of remembrance. For on the evening of their departure from Egypt, the angel of death passed over the homes of the Hebrew people, permitting their firstborn to live, while destroying the firstborn among the Egyptians, including the livestock in their stables, the flocks in their fields, right down to their pets. That is what convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. And from that time on, every year the Hebrew people celebrate this event, remembering how the angel of death passed over the firstborn among this without striking them dead. They called it Passover because the angel of death passed over the firstborn. They still call it Passover. Now in the time of Jesus, Jewish pilgrims from all around the Mediterranean world came to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival of freedom. It would be for them like the 4th of July is for us Americans. Jewish pilgrims came from Egypt and Rome and Arabia, from the island of Crete and from Greece and from what we today call the nation of Turkey. The streets of Jerusalem were shoulder to shoulder with people. The population swelled. Scholars estimate that the population of Jerusalem at that time may have been 50 to 60,000 residents. But with the influx of these pilgrims, the population may have soared to perhaps as many as 300,000 to 450,000, six to nine times the city's usual population. Now, Jesus arrived in Jerusalem at the start of the week-long celebration of Passover, which culminated in what is called the Seder meal. In Jerusalem, he would confront the principalities and powers of this world. In preparation, he sends a couple of his disciples to find a colt which has never been ridden before. The disciples and others cast their cloaks on the colt for Jesus. Along the parade route, the people shout out quotes from our psalm for today, a psalm of gratitude to God for saving the people. And so with excitement in our voices, I invite us to repeat the words of the psalm found on your bulletin insert, the first of the four responses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Open the gates of righteousness I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is how Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. And he isn't just welcomed. He's embraced. Can you hear their voices? Can you hear them cry their hosannas? a Hebrew word which means save us. The people who greet Jesus cry out and let those of us here today repeat the words found in our second um, set of 
uh, responses in the bulletin insert. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us, Lord. But as Jesus rides the colt, although he hears and feels the praises and the adoration of the crowd, there is something else going on in his mind. He knows that his earthly ministry is coming to a climax. Now, many of the pilgrims in the crowd that day imagined that this Jewish king who rides the colt will use military might to drive the Roman legions out of their land and restore the ancient monarchy of King David. That is the way things are done in this world. What so many in the crowd that day did not know is that Jesus had no intention of resorting to military action for his kingdom is a realm of peace. He will take the world not by force, but by love, mercy, and forgiveness. And so there would be those who would reject Jesus and his kingdom of God ways. Even the psalmist recognized this when he wrote the words, and let us all say the, the third one together, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. Ah, but too soon the parade is over. Since it is late in the day, Jesus and his disciples withdraw to the community of Bethany to the east of Jerusalem, where the home of some of his closest friends is located, the home of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. Since you and I understand that the foundation of the kingdom which Jesus inaugurated is based on God's love and mercy, we understand that we cannot attract others to become followers of our Savior by twisting their arms or harassing them or through threats of hell, but only by God's grace. That's why it's so important to show others the love of Jesus and how that is what changes a person on the inside and draws them into a relationship with God. Later in the week when Jesus and his disciples celebrate the Passover feast, the Seder meal, in an upper room and recount all that God had done to save the Hebrew people and set them free from their bondage in Egypt, Jesus will change Two of the symbols of that meal. He takes the unleavened bread, the matzah, and breaks it and says, and let us all say aloud what he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Jesus takes the cup and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And suddenly, an ancient feast takes on a new meaning for the followers of Jesus. Well, today, my friends, I have lifted up the events of what we call Palm Sunday and their connection to the Jewish festival of Passover. I have highlighted the meaning of Passover, the celebration of the salvation of the Hebrew people from slavery to the Egyptians and their freedom as a nation and connected it to the meaning of our sacrament of Holy Communion. In the sacrament of communion, those of us who are followers of Jesus recognize how our Savior saves us, saves us from sin and sets us free to enjoy life anew by the grace and mercy and love of God. It is as Jesus tells us in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel where he speaks about feeding the hungry and giving the thirsty a drink of water, welcoming the stranger, providing shelter for the homeless and clothes for those who need them, looking after the sick and visiting those in prison. And he says that whenever you and I do such compassionate acts, 
It's like we do these things for him. And as often as others see these things in how you and I live and move and have our being in this world through our deeds of compassion, others will be drawn by what they see in us. In a very real way, this is how you and I lay our palms before Jesus who rides into our lives on a colt. And this, my friends, this is our calling in life. Amen. Let us continue our service of worship by rising and singing our next hymn, number 172. Please be seated. As we come to this time of prayer in our service of worship, I'd like to lift up any prayer requests that any of you might have. This week, Dave and Judy celebrate their 58th wedding anniversary. Raise your hand so everybody can... And which one are you celebrating? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, he meant which year, Don? Fifty-three. Fifty-three. Woohoo! Well, congratulations to both couples. Any other prayer requests? If not, uh, let, let us join our hearts and our minds together in a time of prayer. Let us pray.
God of grace, we gather this Sunday remembering Jesus' last week on this earth. We remember his humility in preferring service to lording it over others his boldness in the face of attacks from his enemies, his sorrow over Jerusalem weeping on its population. And we remember the gifts of the bread and the cup through which we continue to connect ourselves with him and with you. And we thank you for our sacrament of Holy Communion, for it continues to strengthen our spiritual lives and reminds us of your presence, a very real presence. On uh, this first day of that last week, we consecrate to you our services of worship, and we pray that your spirit will grasp us and reshape us through our self-searching, through our grieving, and through our rejoicing. May this reliving of the passion and the death of our Savior move our hearts and transform us on the inside. Help us to re-examine our priorities in life that they may more fully show the priorities of Jesus. Deepen our integrity and lead us to a costlier discipleship, O God. Today we would lift up prayers for a number of people. It was last Sunday that Dan Jr. died. And we lift up prayers for his family and pray that you will bring them a measure of comfort in the midst of their loss. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer. And we pray that you'll be with Dion and with Jim. Give them the strength that they need and bless them through all the medications and all that the doctors are doing for them. We give you thanks for the good news we've received about Duff and how he is recovering now from the treatments he's received for his cancer and pray that your spirit will continue to be with him until It's completely gone. We give you thanks for those couples who are celebrating wedding anniversaries this coming week. We thank you for their lives together. And we uh, pray that you will continue to bless them. We thank you for the love that they have experienced through each other. And we pray that your spirit would continue to bless them through that love. We lift up prayers for our country. We pray that all of us may return to a relationship, a strong relationship with you. We need, we need to know what in your eyes is the meaning of freedom. We need to know through you what it means to care about one another. We need to learn through our Savior Jesus how to put aside any partisanship, any hatreds, and learn how to love one another the way that he loves all of your children. Strengthen our faith that we may do what is right. We lift up prayers for the President of these United States of America and for the leaders of all the nations all around the world. We pray that your spirit will guide them with, into peace with justice. And now in the silence of these moments, we lift to you our own thoughts and prayers and petitions. And now hear us, O God, as we lift to you the words to the prayer that Jesus himself 
taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm to offer the prayer of dedication for our church, but before I do that, I want to tell you a little something, and it will tie into this. It's about yesterday's uh, meal for the hungry at St. Luke's Point of Grace. Thank you for your generosity at the last noisy offering we took in between both services, $240. Between my using some food that I found already up there, you know, you get some stuff from food banks, you never know what it is, and between your money I spent $120 to make 60 meals. We served between 35 to 40 people. Some people came back for seconds and thirds. They evidently liked that uh, meatloaf and corn pudding I made and so forth, that's good. Uh, what's left, we took the Harmony House. They were just getting ready to have dinner and they were thrilled to death with those 15 boxed meals at that lowest delivered. Lois is in the back. Lois, will you hold up your hand? That's Lois. And I want to thank all the helpers who came. Um, there was about six of us there, and between all of us, it went very smoothly. Hopefully, uh, next time, uh, we can ask the church to make desserts. I purposely did not this time, because I just thought, well, it's Easter coming up, and everything, we just I would get what we needed. But by June, things should be, should be opened up more, and you'll be seeing asking for some donations of desserts. And hopefully, we'll be able to have people come in, sit down. They like to commune with each other and can sit down at a table and chair and talk and eat and have a cup of coffee. We don't serve coffee, nothing like that. But hopefully, it'll, uh, the people will come back. We're hoping. So. I wanted you to know about that. As secretary of our church council here at St. John's, I want to thank all of you for your support, whether it's through noisy offerings or cooking or whatever, support of our church for your thoughts, prayers, for your participation in a wide variety of ways, and for your financial gifts. Thank you. Thank you for your continued support. Let us pray. Oh God, bless all who support the work of St. John's and through the ministries of our church. May your love spread to our community through our efforts. Amen. Amen. And now uh, I would invite those who are able to rise and let us sing our closing hymn number 176, with waving palms and shouts of praise.
Friends, church is community. It's all about all of us who focus our lives in God and in Jesus. It's about responding to the whispers of the Holy Spirit. And it's about our mutual support in doing the will of God. In community, we bless each other and we are blessed. Go forth then, my fellow disciples, and live in this awareness and under this calling. Amen.